Good evening. My name is Dr. David Doman, and welcome to another edition of House Call. Mental health at the workplace is a hot topic right now. Find out more right now. My guest this evening is my daughter, Melissa Doman, an organizational psychologist who has just published a book on mental health in the workplace. Melissa, welcome to House School. Thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. So briefly tell our viewers about your professional background. So uh, as you said, I'm an organizational psychologist. I'm also a former clinical mental health therapist, and I specialize in mental health at work. So I basically go into businesses of all sizes around the world and help them understand what mental health and mental illness are, and most importantly, how to constructively discuss the, those topics in the workplace. And because all industries and all companies are staffed by humans, this is a topic regardless of background that every company on the planet shares. So my clients range from really large companies like Estee Lauder and Siemens and Salesforce all the way down to tiny 25-person companies and everything in between. Uh, I'm very proud to say that I've been recently featured in the BBC and CNBC about the Great Resignation, which is one of the most interesting psychological phenomena and, and sociological phenomena that has uh, come up since the pandemic kicked off and obviously how that impacts mental health at work. And uh, recently, as of yesterday, I am a published author book is right behind me. And it is a literal how to guide for anyone, no matter where they sit in any business, to learn more about this topic, and most importantly, how they can make a concrete individual impact. Terrific. So you threw a lot of um, uh, terms out there that I want to take a step back to help you define for our viewers. Uh, let's discuss mental health, uh, mental uh, stress and mental illness. Uh, define those for, for our viewers. Most definitely. And it's really important to differentiate those because they are used interchangeably when they shouldn't be. So look at mental health like it's a baseline. It is your baseline social, emotional, and cognitive functioning. Just like you have gastrointestinal health or heart health or sexual health, health of, of this organ is exactly the same. Same. You have the baseline, you have a healthy state, a stress state, and an illness state. So mental health is something that every, every human being on the planet has, and uh, most you know, animals have. It's something that comes you know, standard out of the box. When you look at stress, there is a social negative connotation to that, but that's not actually true. So stress itself is quite neutral. Stress is basically when you encounter a stimulus or response that requires adjustment. That's it. So stress can be good, it can be bad, but it's when you have too much of either of those that you start getting into issues and you can go into a stressed state in the brain or if left unmanaged for a really long time, potentially an illness state. It's a very slippery slope. But a mental health condition, also known as mental illness, is a diagnosable condition that impacts your cognitive functioning, your behaviors and how you interact with people and your environment, and it impacts daily functioning enough. And you have certain number of symptoms happening at the same time for a certain duration of time to meet the diagnostic criteria for mental illness. So some of the most well-known ones are major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, different types of substance abuse, different types of eating disorders, PTSD, personality disturbances. Globally, one in four people has a diagnosed mental health condition. I would venture to say that's underreported. And on top of that, with the, the current state of the world and where it's been trending in the past two years, I would venture to say that in, in my lifetime, the, that one in four will sadly become one in three or one in two. And so if you look at those numbers, there are a lot of people in the workplace who have struggles with mental health, struggles with chronic stress, and also mental illness, and they just don't talk about it. How appropriate is it for a, an employee 
given uh, emotional issues, as you've outlined it, to bring that to the workplace and discuss it with a manager. Traditionally, they're reluctant to do that. Rightfully so, because for a very, very, very long time, not only was this topic not understood, but it was also avoided and heavily stigmatized, and in some ways it still is. So the biggest thing I would say is people need to understand why they're sharing that information. I think mental health awareness is wonderful. That's a lot of my job. Where I think the mental health work industry misses out is by encouraging people to share with a purpose and educating people on what they want others to do with that information. So let's say, for example, that you struggle with IBS, or let's say that you struggle with some other chronic form of physical illness or syndrome or something like that. Let's say it's going to be impacting how often you're available or how you may be feeling. Having a mental health condition is literally no different. So if you want your manager or your colleagues to know that you might be communicating a certain way because of anxiety or because of something else, so they don't make assumptions and to know how to best communicate with you. And also, if we look at the human case, this is an organ like any other organ in the body. So when people have decided that this organ is scary, we can't talk about this organ, even though you bring this organ to work and it does the job we ask you to do. Doesn't make a lot of sense when you talk about it like that. So it's really not only destigmatizing, talking about also another chronic health issue that happens to be in this part of the body, but also why are you sharing it with people just so they can, can know and twiddle their thumbs? That's not useful. Share with a purpose. Make sure that you tell people why you're telling them and what you want them to do with the information. So that's from an employee perspective. Uh, then there is the management perspective on this. Traditionally, they have not discussed that with employees. Mm -hmm. And part of it may be because em employers, managers, what have you, may not be comfortable. They may say to you, wait a minute, I went to Wharton School of Business and we covered um, uh, uh, price points for products we're going to manufacture. We covered marketing, we covered advertising, on and on and on. But I, I don't recall being um, uh, provided with a psychology degree. So what would you say to the managers who traditionally are uncomfortable covering these topics? Good news is you don't need a psychology degree. And checking in with someone about how they're feeling is a skill set to be developed like any other skill set and in today's workplace is, is necessary as a leader and as a people manager because people bring all of their experiences with them into the workplace, whether it is into a physical building that hopefully has COVID protocols or through a Zoom like this. And to not know how to have those discussions with the current state of existence we are all in is to not be a complete people leader. This is a non-negotiable must have skill set. It doesn't mean you're turning into a psychiatrist or a therapist or a doctor or a social worker. It just means how can you have basic constructive conversations, make your team feel psychologically safe to do so, and most importantly, to triage them to the appropriate resource that can help them better than you can. It's really just about redirecting the energy that people hide they, they use that energy to hide that information from their boss and being able to use that information actually toward, you know, that energy towards work instead of hiding something that is totally healthy and normal. So it's helping leaders to understand we're not training you up to become psychologists. We're training you up to become em empathetic listeners where your teams aren't afraid to tell you that something is going on with them. So you feel that addressing uh, this overdue uh, issue, mental health in the workplace, is uh, an important regular conversation. Oh, 100%. This is not a one discussion conversation, but it's also not, you know, something you should be doing every single day when you're messaging someone saying, are you feeling depressed today? Are you okay? You got to be a little natural about it. And so sure. it's really about finding what works in the team or within the division or within the company about what is a realistic, helpful cadence. What do you want this to look like? How do you want these conversations to show up? When should they show up? 
So really defining what good looks like in practice, not just in strategy and theory. I think in retrospect, what's interesting about this important topic you're bringing up is unfortunately a headline that uh, rears its ugly head every few weeks to months nationally is um, uh, mass shootings in the workplace. Do you yeah. think in retrospect, uh, ignoring this issue uh, engenders that uh, tragedy? There are a couple of things going on. So the state of mental health in the United States has been consistently declining year on year on year on year. And the CDC put out a report, and this is now over a year old, that between June 2019 and June 2020, the rates of clinical anxiety and depression quadrupled in the United States. However, there are so many conversations that were avoided or skipped that could have been had, but weren't due to social stigma or whichever circles people were running in. And also, and I'm conscious this is very off topic, uh, the politicization of, of all of it uh, certainly doesn't help either. So with mass shootings, there are sometimes mental health issues that go along with that, but not always. So when we have the sorts of, uh, of shootings, what I often find is that for the ones who don't have a diagnosed mental health condition, they actually do the sorts of things based on unmet needs. So people who are trying to get control in one aspect of their life because they feel like they don't have control anywhere else. And when you hold a weapon, it can make you feel powerful. So for those folks who don't fit the, the clinical diagnostic criteria for a mental health condition, it really just seems like it's coming from unmet needs and warped perceptions of ways to fill those needs. And well, listen, again, we're, we're going we're gonna to pause there for a public service announcement. Sorry to cut you off. We'll be right back with uh, organizational psychologist Melissa Doman discussing mental health and uh, illness in the workplace. We'll be right back. Practicing meditation, mindfulness, or other spiritual practices can help ground you. For more tips, visit coping-19.org. We're back. My guest this evening is my daughter, Melissa Doman, an organizational psychologist who has just published his book about mental health and stress in the workplace. Melissa, share with our viewers why you wrote this book because it shouldn't have it should have been written so long ago and I'm so happy that I finally got the opportunity now because it is a literal how-to guide of how and why to talk about mental health at work and over all the years with the different events and things I've done with companies I found that there was really a need for not only a playbook that people can have but a realistic playbook that also looks at the perceptions and beliefs and the obstacles of us getting there. What happens if the conversation goes wrong? What happens in you know potential emergency situations? You know, I think it's important to talk about all shades of gray of this topic, not just through rose-colored lenses or shattered glass, but somewhere in between. So there are a lot of um, trends that have come up in the mental health at work industry that have also been a bit counterproductive. And so I wrote about that as well in the book in terms of the realistic expectation setting that people need to do when it comes to these sorts of conversations. And most importantly, how to focus on what you can do as an individual, because all of the data is there in terms of why this is important to talk about at work, the business case, the human case, it, it's all been proven. People don't need to hear that from me. What they do need to hear is, well, this is all well and good. How do I actually do it? And that is what the book equips them to do. Well, I had uh, the pleasure uh, of reading your book, which I found to be both very informative and at the same time written in a breezy manner. So it's an easy <laughs> read. And uh, I, I was struck by uh, a lot of uh, interesting information. Uh, you mentioned the term uh, uh, toxic positivity. What yes. exactly is that? 
<laughs> um, you definitely paid attention to what you read. I Toxic positivity is something that happens all the time. People do it all the time and they don't mean to have the negative consequences that come from that. So toxic positivity is basically always encouraging the silver lining, always encouraging to look on the bright side, always encouraging about looking at a, a better perspective. But what that really translates into is you telling someone your negative feelings are not welcome in this conversation with me. Sometimes people just need to feel bad. And more than half of the emotions that we are naturally programmed with are not positive emotions. The reason that they're there is to signpost to you and other people around you that something is not right and you need support. So by telling someone, oh, it's going to be fine, or it's going to be okay, or have you thought about it like this, that's not what people need. Sometimes they just need to be told, I'm really sorry that happened. That sucks. They just want to be validated. They want to be heard. And these natural emotions need to just occur and run their course. Because when you push them down, they tend to come out sideways. At times, you don't want them to, and towards people, you don't want them to. So when I talk about toxic positivity in a lot of deliveries I do with businesses, so many people go, oh my God, I do that all the time and I'm going to stop right now. <laughs> well, one thing I really enjoyed about the book was not only you're making the case for mental uh, health issues in the workplace and how important it is to address it, but then you actually provided with each chapter some um, uh, uh, practice sessions for the, yes. for the reader, uh, giving them practical uh, pointers. Uh, let's go on to uh, put in some other terms that I was struck by. Toxic masculinity. Oh, that's a doozy. So there is a section in the book on something that I call gender-based emotion shaming. And I'm conscious that uh, gender is a very fluid concept and that there are a whole variety of gender identities. And for uh, the purpose of that section, it tends to refer to the traditionally binary designations of gender, where no matter if you identify as you know female or male, uh, both have pretty, pretty crap ends of the stick because there is a stereotype attached to whatever gender you are when it comes to displaying emotion and especially displaying emotion in the workplace. So there's a, a not so great one for women and there's a not so great one for men. So historically speaking, and this is globally, men have been highly discouraged from displaying emotion because it has been falsely equated to weakness. Nothing could be further from the truth. So unfortunately, lots of men for a very, very, very long time, and even now, have been pressured to adhere to this, this toxic masculinity at all costs. And typically it can be not only, you know, um, kind of poking from other men, but it can even come from women sometimes. And also when women are hard on each other uh, separately, I call that girl on girl crime, because we are taking each other down instead of holding each other up. And the sad thing is Men, I think it's, it's ages uh, 18 to 64, very unfortunately have a massive problem with suicide. That doesn't come from, from nowhere. It's when you feel like you can't talk about your emotions because you'll be judged or people will doubt your efficacy or they'll doubt your ability to do your job or be a parent or a leader. You know, a lot of men hide that stuff to the, the literal death. And toxic masculinity is something that lots of advocates and activists I know are actively fighting against because suicide rates amongst men are frighteningly high, depending on the country. And it's also just utter nonsense. Just because you identify as male doesn't mean you're not supposed to display the emotions that you naturally have like every other human being on the planet. And so it, it's unfortunate when I encounter those moments and I, I try and use honey instead of vinegar uh, to create a teachable moment instead of being like, stop that. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a prevalent issue still. What about um, racial inequality in the workplace? How much stress does that create? There is not a word to describe how large of a stress that creates. Uh, I'm sure there is a word, but the one I would use is gargantuan. 
it is really unfortunate. I wrote an entire chapter on it where a lot of organizations are quite nervous to address it because they don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. They are concerned about liability or saying the wrong thing. And other organizations go so far in the opposite direction that they approach their employees of color and they will say, will you be the poster child to show that we're doing something also wrong and incorrigible and not authentic at all. So it really is so completely awful if, if people are experiencing racially based trauma in their personal lives and they feel like they can't talk about it at work because their colleagues would be uncomfortable, which is completely ridiculous. You would not ask anybody else who encounters so many moments of of systemic trauma or you know interpersonal uh racism and things like that you just if it was a different topic you wouldn't ask people not to talk about it it's because it's one of the hotter more delicate complicated topics that workplaces are wrestling with how to bring that up but the good news is that it's it's coming quickly so lots of companies are realizing not only can they no longer avoid the discussion, they shouldn't avoid the discussion and understanding why they should open the discussion and learning how to move forward because clearly what was happening wasn't working before. So you can either take the red pill or the blue pill. One thing that's very uh, exciting about your book is you not only made the case that mental health is an important issue in the workplace and also provided very practical pointers how to address this, but you even, uh, at the end of your book, uh, provided updates on the challenges, the unique challenges of COVID-19 in the workplace. Oh, Tell our yeah. viewers more about that. Yeah, so I actually wrote the book. I wrote the manuscript going from lockdown to lockdown from when we moved from London back to Washington, D.C. And so the, the chapter on COVID was written in real time. And it was explained to the reader that it was a capture in time about how things have evolved and some watch outs to be aware of going forward in terms of how to incorporate this new reality that is, is not going away anytime soon from the pandemic and how it's shifting those conversations in ways that you have to be aware of. And there's a lot of stuff to cover and I'm conscious we don't have tons of time, but it's really around the best way that I can sum it up is that everyone is swimming in a sea of triggers and they're trying to find a boat. And I would suppose given the um, uh, embracing of a lot of uh, home uh, work uh, uh, rather mm -hmm. than commuting in the traditional fashion, the unique uh, emotional stresses to working at home and living at mm -hmm. home at the same time. Yeah. So what's really interesting is that the two biggest areas are emotionally and also socially for obvious reasons but when the brain likes to have variety of experiences when you don't and you have a perpetual groundhog day sort of situation it doesn't really help with brain health so for example when you're not having a variety of experiences and it's the same stuff over and over again it will shrink your hippocampus, which is connected to, as a doctor, I'm sure you know, memory. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people who are having a lot of issues remembering, you know, the thing for like a basic object or why they went into a room. I call it pandemic brain, but now it's also evolved into a popular social term when you're feeling kind of blah and you don't feel great, you don't feel terrible, it's called languishing. So people have this sense of like malaise and repetition and being trapped in the same walls, but also they're not having that separation of what's called the third space between going from home to work and back to home. So that lack of separation not only makes you feel trapped, which doesn't make you feel great, it can also put stress on your relationships. So depending on who you live with at home, uh, you know, typically it's a, a seeing you sometimes thing, but now it's an all the time thing. I, I joke that, for example, uh, par partnerships or married couples, that used to be a nights and weekends thing, and it's not anymore. So a lot of relationships are going through a lot of stress, and, and some of those are fracturing because it is, 
it's on it's unprecedented and people are having trouble coping with that constant being together which sometimes is wonderful and sometimes it's not so wonderful but also bringing in those stressors from the world into the home and if you also have kids that you had to homeschool when schools weren't open my heart goes out to those parents i cannot even imagine what it was like to do that and work and be at home all the time it, it's just too much and then there's a lot of folks who if they struggle with something called imposter syndrome they basically think all of their success is related to external factors and luck as opposed to their own hard work so it, the fancy way of describing it is self-perceived intellectual fraudulence <laughs> And so if you're working at home and it's a bit of out of sight, out of mind, people get concerned that their value is not being recognized and that triggers a whole cocktail of worry. And it's uh, some people have found a way to to adjust and create you know, certain space at home and, and find their way through it. And other people have reported feeling like a trapped animal. Uh, and most are somewhere in between. Melissa, you've been a wonderful guest. Thank you so much for this practical information for our viewers. Uh, thank you for my team at the studio. And thank you, the viewer, for welcoming us into your home. Tell us how we're doing. You can reach me at my practice website, MontgomeryGastro.com. As for our next guest, next month, we'll be covering all the latest diagnostic and therapeutic approaches to lung cancer. It's going to be a very interesting show. See you then next time for another edition of House Call. Good evening. Mm -hmm.